Welcome to this very special program. I'm sure we know Steve Messer much better than we've done a few years ago. So uh, welcome back to this place. And we are looking forward to someone who's been around in this kind of important uh, avenues for making peace. And so, Steve, just take it away. <laughs> All right. How's that? Is that? That's good? Okay. Get rid of the little thing there. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Roger. And um, I am delighted uh, to be here sharing with you this morning. Um, over the course of my career um, at Taylor University, um, I taught the civil rights movement a number of times, uh, many times actually. And um, as, as I went on doing that, uh, the importance of the music just kept coming clearer and clearer to me. And, uh, and then I had a chance to talk uh, to some members of SNCC uh, from the 1960s, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and particularly Julian Bond, um, who died in uh, 2015, unfortunately, but was a mainstay of civil rights activity uh, here in the United States. And um, Julian uh, Bond, uh, just he would kind of light up whenever you talked about music and the music of the movement. And he would remind us all when we were talking to him that he couldn't sing a lick. As a matter of fact, uh, he wrote a sort of a parody on uh, SNCC when he was involved with SNCC in the 1960s. Again, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mostly college students who were very active in the movement. And uh, one of the things he said uh, is, if you see me singing at a mass meeting, don't follow me because I can't sing. And, uh, but, but he would just light up in terms of the significance uh, of the movement, and then also had the chance once to talk to Rutha Harris, and we'll talk a little bit about her as we go on, but she was one of the mainstays from Albany, Georgia, 
uh, which was the site of a, a major civil rights campaign in 61 and 62, going into 63. And um, she, you know, um, again, when she talked about the importance of music uh, to the movement, she would just light up. Not that it was always celebratory, because oftentimes it wasn't. Uh, oftentimes they were dealing with the obstacles and opposition and threats uh, to the movement. But, but again, uh, Mrs. Harris was just uh, a delight to talk to. So again, it's, it's just my privilege, I think, to sort of share some of the things that people have shared with me um, as we went along. Now, the title, Beyond We Shall Overcome. Um, I chose that because almost everybody knows about We Shall Overcome. It's, it's the anthem of the civil rights movement in many ways. Uh, started as a sacred song, became a labor song in the 1940s, and then through the efforts of uh, Pete Seeger and uh, Guy Carowin at the Highlander Folk School, it kind of made its way into the civil rights uh, movement itself. And again, we, nobody can uh, underestimate or overestimate, really, the importance of We Shall Overcome. People sang it when they were rejoicing in the aftermath of the March on Washington in 1963. Uh, a week and two weeks uh, roughly later, they sang it as they carried the bodies of the young girls who were killed in Birmingham out of the church for their funerals. And they would often sing it, almost always, you would sing it holding hands. And so We Shall Overcome is obviously critical. Uh, to understanding the music of the movement. But there are many, many other songs. And oftentimes people are not aware of these other songs. And these songs kind of give additional insight uh, into the movement and into the obstacles that the participants and their supporters uh, were dealing with. So beyond we shall overcome. And in some ways, it's kind of like when historians study the civil rights movement as a whole, uh, for years they focused on Dr. King. And that's kind of where things started when you studied the civil rights movement. But then in the 80s and 90s, they kind of moved beyond Dr. King, not minimizing him, still critical to understanding it, but looking at local people, looking at people like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, looking at people like Wilma Gilmore in, Mo in Montgomery, uh, you know, looking at all these folks who were on the local level and didn't get the publicity that Dr. King did and yet we're the backbone of the movement. And so in some ways, what we're doing here is kind of reflecting that emphasis on trying to get down to a more local level uh, for understanding the civil rights movement. All righty. Okay, foundations of the freedom songs. Um, and, and a lot of you are probably aware of this, but you often go back to spirituals, uh, African-American spirituals, uh, traditional hymns uh, sung in black and white churches, um, gospel music from the early 20th century, uh, R&B, a rhythm and blues uh, from mid-century into the 60s. Uh, labor movement songs are really huge uh, in civil rights music. And then uh, other popular genres. So, for example, uh, one of the songs we're going to listen to a little bit down the road is Calypso Freedom. Uh, and it's, it's based off the Banana Boat song by Harry Belafonte in the 1950s. Uh, so again, uh, and then also one thing to remember is, is the moment. A number of these songs were actually written or adapted in the moment. I was amazed at the number of freedom songs that were written in jail. People are in jail and they're writing these songs to reflect what they're experiencing and who they're experiencing it with. And so, uh, again, remember the moment. Or they write songs that reflect their mourning after people have been murdered in the civil rights movement, the martyrs of the movement. So again, never forget the importance of the moment as well. Um, significance of, the, of songs in the civil rights movement, again, it gives us context uh, for understanding how these folks did what they did. Because when they would sing, okay, and by the way, the clips we're going to listen to today were recorded in mass meetings in the 1960s or in workshops in the 1960s, 
Okay, so we're actually going to kind of go back uh, to those moments. And as a result of that, there will be skips in the recording and little glitches. Uh, but but the, it'll, it'll work. Trust me, it'll work. Gary and I have worked on this a couple times, and it, it'll work. So, uh, so the, the context is, again, understanding that they... They sang because it was often part of their culture already in the black churches that many of them went to. Um, they sang because they were trying to basically inspire themselves, uh, oftentimes inspire unity. Uh, they sang because they were naming the people who were oppressing them in their songs. They sang because they were mourning. These songs actually mourned people who died on a regular basis in the movement. And then also these songs uh, functioned as a way of connecting. They connected the movement with broader social trends and broader international trends as well, particularly the independence movement in Africa uh, that was going on into the late 50s and into the 60s. And so we're going to listen to songs that reflect uh, th this effort to inspire, this effort to name, this effort to mourn, this effort to connect. But be aware, as we listen to these songs, you're going to hear overlap. There are songs that I have categorized as inspirational uh, that also reflect, for example, uh, perhaps mourning. Uh, so there, there's a crossover here. There's an overlap in terms of the themes. All right. Let's uh, move on here. Okay, first song we're going to listen to in the inspiring category is We're Marching On to Freedom Land. This is a song that came out of the Birmingham movement, uh, particularly in 1963. The person leading it is Carlton Reese, and he led uh, the choir at many of the movement uh, mass meetings that were held in Birmingham at this time. And the thing to remember about this song is uh, We're Marching On to Freedom Land. They would often sing this in the 16th Street Baptist Church or one of the other movement churches in Birmingham and then walk down the steps and march, okay? Head to City Hall, head to downtown, whatever the uh, sort of goal of their demonstration was. So uh, this is Marching On to Freedom Land, uh, a clip from it. We won't be listening to the whole song, but uh, a clip. <laughs> Okay, uh, and again, um, there's a sense with, with all of these songs too, and you hear it here, um, they're, they're singing also to create a space, to have a voice. And really it's a way of establishing agency. It's something they can do, it's something they can control, and it's seeking to go out and do something often. Oftentimes that's, that's the goal. And so you also heard sort of the call and response approach uh, that has deep roots in African-American music, uh, African music for that matter. And um, so again, a wonderful song uh, with Carlton Reese and, and really the children of Birmingham kind of singing in the background. Next song is Go Tell It on the Mountain. 
traditional Christmas song, but in the civil rights context, it was sung with the idea of let my people go. You know, and, and sometimes eventually in 1964 during Freedom Summer, it would be let my people vote. Okay, so this is Fannie Lou Hamer singing and she is one of the amazing people of the civil rights movement. Um, she was a sharecropper uh, in Mississippi, Ruleville, Mississippi. Uh, she did not get involved in civil rights activities until she was 44 years old. And she went to a church meeting one night where the SNCC workers who were coming in encouraged everyone to register to vote. 44 years old in rural Mississippi, as a black woman, this is the first time it occurred to her that she could vote in the United States. And so she becomes a mainstay, not just of the Mississippi movement, but of the civil rights movement as a whole. It dedicates the rest of her life, uh, really, to social justice causes. And she didn't live all that long. She lived another 15 years uh, till 1977. But this, uh, this is actually a 1962 recording in Greenville, Mississippi, of Mrs. Hamer uh, singing this song. Okay, and, and there's a verse further on down, uh, and I'm not even sure it's on this recording, but where she's, uh, where she's singing, uh, looks like the children that Bob Moses led. Okay, and of course, Bob Moses was uh, one of the leaders of SNCC uh, in uh, Mississippi and other places as well. And so uh, she takes, in that sense, she takes the words, look like the children that Moses led, and changes it to Bob Moses uh, led. And uh, again, go tell it on the mountain. And Mrs. Hamer and her voice uh, are just, I mean, an incredible, incredible gift uh, to the movement. Uh, and she not only would sing, she would speak. And she would tell the truth to power. And uh, her goal in life is once she got involved in the civil rights movement was to tell it like it is. And one of her famous quotes appears on her tombstone in Ruleville, Mississippi. And it says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So uh, Mrs. Hamer, and one of her signature songs, she sang at, at meetings all over the place. Uh, the, the last one under this category, sort of inspiring people uh, to carry on the movement, is uh, We Shall Not Be Moved. And um, this is actually a, um, an older uh, sacred song, um, but it uh, was transformed into a union song in the 1940s. Coal, striking coal workers in Kentucky uh, used this song. And then um, it was also, uh, the words were changed uh, in jail. People were in jail because of the Freedom Rides in 1961 down in Mississippi. And so they changed the words and then it made, it, it made its way from Jackson, Mississippi over to Albany, Georgia. And, and that's where it really took hold, in Albany, Georgia. And Albany, Georgia is one of the centers of movement music. I mean, this was a singing town, at least the black population uh, were, were singers uh, in Albany. And um, what you're gonna hear here are the SNCC Freedom Singers, and Rutha Harris uh, is kind of leading things, and Bernice Johnson Regan, uh, who has become critical uh, in recent days, I mean, uh, in recent decades, really, uh, for preserving the mu movement music and also for originating the group Sweet Honey, Honey in the Rock. Uh, so this is uh, We Shall Not Be Moved.
And again, um, that's typical Albany civil rights music with the clapping sort of on the backbeat uh, and the different parts that people were singing and that kind of interaction between the song leader and uh, the congregation. Um, and and it, it, Albany civil rights move, music has a particular sound. I mean, you could pick it out. All right, let's see. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, the next category is naming. Uh, naming uh, people who uh, are opposed to the movement. And um, th there, this happens a lot in, in the songs of the civil rights movement. Uh, the first one we're gonna listen to again comes from Albany, uh, Georgia. And uh, this one was written by Bertha Gober. Uh, again, in jail in Albany, uh, uh, the chief of police, Lori Pritchard, and the mayor, Asa Kelly, uh, were taking a hard line on demonstrations. Now, they were trying not to be brutal uh, like other folks, you know, particularly in Birmingham and places in Mississippi. But still, uh, it was dehumanizing. They were putting people in small cells, I mean, overloading these cells and uh, treating them poorly in terms of food and sanitation. And so... Uh, that leads to this song, O Pritchard, O Kelly, which is a rewrite of Rock in Jerusalem, O Mary, O Martha. Whoops. I'm sorry about that. Okay, and again, uh, the idea there, the bond's getting higher. You know, who's going to pay uh, for this? And yet, the, the, the issue for the civil rights workers was often, we're not going to pay our bond or bail until we have to. We're going to go to jail. We're going to fill up the jails, and we're going to make it difficult for y'all, you know, in doing this. And Ruth Harris has a wonderful sort of anecdote about this song. She was also arrested, and she was in jail in Albany, and they were singing this song, and, and Chief Pritchard came along and uh, said, you know, I kind of like that song. You know, I'll sing that song again, the one you wrote about me. And, and so they would. And uh, later in life, Chief Pritchard actually had a change of heart, and so much so to the point that um, he was applying for another job years later, and Andrew Young of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference wrote him a reference uh, for the job. So he, he kind of came around a little bit. Next, next song is from Selma and the voting rights campaign that started there in 1963, but is most notable in 1965. We've just 
uh, commemorated the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday uh, recently on, on March 7th. And uh, the, George Wallace, of course, was the governor of Alabama. And the last thing he wanted is people to march uh, from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, and that became the goal in Selma after uh, several murders, civil rights murders, particularly Jimmy Lee Jackson from Marion, uh, Alabama. And uh, they were going to march to, to uh, demonstrate the need for voting rights. And Wallace says, no, you're not. Well, eventually a federal judge said, yes, you are going to let him march. Uh, and this song was incredibly popular on the march. Uh, it was written by James Orange, who worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization. And in this case, uh, kind of led by Charles uh, Neblett. And, and here's a connection uh, to sort of popular music of this era, too. was sung uh, throughout different venues of the civil rights movement. Uh, it's a song that I'm sure all of us have uh, performed at times, probably in vacation Bible school or Sunday school. Uh, this little light of mine. And uh, again, this becomes a song, um, as, as you may well remember, that you could, you could change the verses as you, as you go, you know. And so uh, it's a mainstay of the civil rights movement. And this is uh, Betty Mae Fikes uh, leading um, a choir in Selma during the Selma uh, voting rights uh, movement. And you will hear her mention Governor Wallace in there and also Jim Clark, who was the local county sheriff, who was uh, incredibly brutal. He's the guy who used cattle prods and uh, beat people and just, you know, uh, was, was terrible, brutal. So uh, they mentioned uh, his name as well in here.
Okay, you can probably <clears throat> think of a few names you'd like to substitute in there <laughs> these days. I know I can. Um, but um, and it, this is interesting. This was actually Fannie Lou Hamer's favorite song to sing, um, going back to Fannie Lou Hamer, because she, as a Christian, uh, she was particularly struck by Matthew chapter 5 and the encouragement not to hide your light under a bushel, and, but to let it shine. And so she said she was going to spend the rest of her life letting her light shine. And, and uh, Betty Mae Ficus uh, had the same sort of uh, attitude. All right, let's see if we can. No, there we go. Okay, warning. Um, there are so many songs uh, that deal with loss uh, during the civil rights movement. And again, remember, this was a, a real um, potential occurrence for folks. Uh, in 1961, when the Freedom Rides started, uh, the group that originally left Washington, D.C., which was a core Congress uh, of racial equality uh, group, um, wrote out their wills before they left. And they were aware of death um, and the potential of death. And uh, when the um, Northern College students, about 800 or so of them, went to Mississippi in the summer of 64 for Freedom Summer, um, one of the things they were told uh, as they were doing their training in Oxford, Ohio, was that death was a possibility. Um, so they knew they faced this, and, and yet it happened. And when it happened, one of the ways they processed it was to sing and to uh, memorialize people um, who had given their lives. So the first one is the Ballad of Medgar Evers. Um, this was written by Matthew Jones shortly after Medgar Evers was assassinated in June of 1963. He was the uh, NAACP State Field Secretary in Mississippi. He had been a World War II veteran. He'd come back to Mississippi with his brother Charles Evers, uh, determined to vote, uh, had been denied the right to vote in the 1946 election, and committed the rest of his life uh, to working for justice uh, in Mississippi. He had just spoken at a rally uh, in Mississippi. He had pulled into the driveway of his home uh, in North Jackson, uh, his wife, uh, Merle Lee, and his two um, sons were inside the house. They heard the shots ring out, and he was uh, killed in his uh, driveway. And um, so, I mean, it was a terrible, terrible loss. Eventually, the guy who killed him, Byron D. LeBeckwith, uh, was finally convicted in 1994 of um, killing him and actually died in prison in uh, 2001, I believe. So um, again, The Ballad of Medgar Evers uh, by Matthew, uh, written by Matthew Jones. In Jackson, Mississippi, in 1963, there lived a man who was brave. He And for some reason, that recording just cut off right there. So again, some of the problems of dealing with uh, recordings 
uh, from the 60s. But um, again, um, music helped them mourn um, and helped them keep going on because it helped them mourn the deaths and, the, and also assigning significance uh, to those deaths. Uh, the next song is uh, probably the most haunting, I think the most haunting uh, song of the civil rights era, We'll Never Turn Back. And uh, again, uh, Bertha Gober uh, wrote this song. Uh, Emery Harris is gonna be uh, singing it with her. Uh, comes out of Mississippi. Um, in uh, 1962, uh, Reverend Herbert Lee, um, who was a farmer, uh, a pastor, a father, a husband, um, was gunned down in public by a member of the Mississippi State Legislature over a dispute of money. And um, the guy walked, the guy who shot him. Um, but um, in Mississippi, um, they were dealing with sort of death on a regular basis. Remember Emmett Till, uh, 1955, um, and then uh, Herbert Lee <laughs> and, and some others. Um, so many people died in Mississippi during the movement era uh, that um, after some of the deaths uh, in 1964, well, 63 and four, uh, Nina Simone, uh, great uh, African-American singer at the time, uh, wrote a song called Mississippi Goddamn, in which she said, and I mean every word. Uh, because, I mean, Mississippi was unbelievably dangerous. Um, civil rights workers sometimes had bumper stickers on their car that said, you're in Mississippi, proceed with caution. Uh, I mean, it was, it was brutal. So anyway, the, the Bertha Gober wrote this song, and I, I want to kind of give you the words because it, it is haunting and sometimes hard to hear. It says, we've been buked and we've been scorned We've been talked about sure as you're born, but we'll never turn back. No, we'll never turn back until we've all been freed and we have equality. We have walked through the shadows of death. We have had to walk all by ourselves. We have hung our head and cried for those like Lee who died, died for you and died for me. category I want to talk about it is very, very general, uh, just sort of connections uh, with broader issues, broader life. Uh, the first song, just a short clip of Calypso Freedom, um, again, uh, building on Harry Belly, Belafonte's song. Of course, Harry Belafonte was an incredible supporter of the movement. Uh, he would hold concerts. Um, he would donate money. 
Um, he actually paid in 1964 for a group of SNCC folks uh, to go tour Africa uh, and particularly talk with the leaders of newly independent African countries. So, I mean, he was a big supporter. So uh, this, this is kind of the uh, 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 taking off on, on that uh, very popular song uh, from the 50s and 60s. And again, you can hear uh, mentions of uh, President Kennedy, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, and this was uh, uh, written uh, shortly after, or adapted shortly after the Freedom Rides, uh, when there was some frustration on the part of civil rights workers because they didn't uh, think the federal government was doing enough to protect their rights on interstate uh, travel. And so, uh, and hence that part about riding on a Greyhound bus but also calling out the Kennedys uh, for uh, helping them. <clears throat> the last song um, reveals a connection to uh, African affairs. Uh, this song, Okinga Odinga, um, was written in uh, 19, late 63, early 64. There's debate about that. But uh, when it was actually uh, put to music. But uh, the background here is that um, Kenya achieved its independence uh, in 1963 under the leadership of Jomo Kenyatta and many others. And um, they actually sent, Kenya along with the State Department, sent an official, Okinga Odinga, to tour the United States. So the State Department arranged for him to visit Atlanta. And um, uh, there was two integrated hotels in Atlanta at this time. The Peachtree Manor was one of them, and that's where he stayed. And the State Department did not notify the local SNCC volunteers, but they found out. And so uh, they went down to talk to Okinga Odinga, and uh, they spent some time uh, with him singing African freedom songs and freedom songs from the movement, <coughs> excuse me, and chatting with him, and, and had a, a really great experience. And then they went next door to a restaurant called the Toddle House, um, which was not integrated. And so they were arrested, the SNCC workers, and, and, and put in jail. And it's in jail where Matthew Jones started writing this song, Okinga Odinga. Now, when you listen to this, it's, it's really fascinating because they, they reference the Mau Mau, which was part of the uh, resistance to British control in Kenya, a group that, uh, it, it, um, engaged in efforts to overthrow the British. And of course, they mentioned Jomo Kenyatta too, who becomes the first president of the independent uh, Kenya. And then um, they also have this sort of freedom now chant and underneath it, you hear the Swahili word for freedom, Uhuru. So it's a, it's a very interesting song, but again, reflects this fascination that the SNCC folks had with African independence at this time. We went down to the peace tree of Mama to see old King Corotina. The holy bear was to Mama to see old King Corotina. The police need a mighty heart. 
Now, another significant of that song is it indicates the growth of a new sort of militants with some of the SNCC folks. I mean, the idea of calling Jomo Kenyatta is essentially saying, look, you know, if we can't solve this one way, we might think about another way. Um, and, uh, you know, and using force. And so uh, SNCC was... was um, kind of evolving during the mid 60s because the SNCC folks had witnessed so much brutality, so much death, so much uh, beatings and, and so on, uh, that some of them were starting to question uh, their commitment to nonviolence. Um, and, and this song is, is a great song. I mean, you know, it's fascinating in terms of the themes and everything, but it also reflects this um, growing impatience uh, with things. All righty. Okay, um, again, um, by way of conclusion, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions, uh, these are just major categories and examples. I mean, you know, there are so many songs. Uh, freedom songs from the 60s that you could use in a presentation like this. Um, there were musical groups and performers that traveled around uh, singing these songs. Uh, the SNCC Freedom Singers are probably the most famous. They would sing all over the country to raise money uh, for SNCC. CORE uh, had their Freedom Singers that would go out and about. There was a group called the Integration Grooves. Uh, that would go and sing. And, uh, and then you also had uh, popular uh, singers who incorporated uh, social justice and civil rights into their songs. Uh, uh, think of Joan Baez, uh, and particularly her song, Birmingham Sunday, honoring the uh, young people who were killed in the church bombing. Um, Nina Simone, I've already mentioned. Uh, Bob Dylan, of course. Uh, Sam Cooke. And then Pete Seeger as well. I mean, Pete Seeger was absolutely critical. Uh, and I've shared one sort of example of that in terms of him getting uh, We Shall Overcome out uh, in the very early 60s to some of the different civil rights organizations. So uh, these groups are going around. And, and also, um, Coretta Scott King um, gave concerts, freedom concerts. And she told the history of civil rights through poetry, uh, other readings, and song. And uh, between 64 and 67, she gave about 30 of these concerts to raise money uh, for uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, <clears throat> lastly, uh, I think just obviously critical to understanding the movement, particularly in some of the localities of the movement, and also hearing voices of people that sometimes don't get heard. Uh, with these songs, and an example of the humanness of the movement. I think sometimes we forget uh, that these folks were human. They did great things, but they were human. Uh, they dated each other, they laughed with each other, they cried with each other, and I think you can, uh, one way you can get at that 
uh, is, is through music, uh, understanding their humanness. Uh, sources, uh, primary sources I use for this, the Smithsonian Folkways has a wonderful uh, disc set here on Voices of Freedom of Civil Rights Movement. And then um, <coughs> um, Sing for Freedom, the story of the Civil Rights Movement through his songs uh, by, uh, compiled by Guy and Candy Carawan. Uh, who were uh, very active at the Highlander Folk School and uh, with the music in the movement. So, so uh, thank you. And um, do we have some questions? Steve, could you just tell us a little bit about your classes and how popular this particular course was and how often you taught it? Um, let's see, I, I taught at Taylor for 28 years. I, I probably taught the civil rights movement 20 times. I taught at traditional sort of classroom experience. Uh, I taught it through film, uh, both documentary and feature films. And then I taught, uh, I took about 13 tours, civil rights tours of the South. Um, it, it was very, very positive, um, uh, and and of course, um, you, it, it was often an elective. So, uh, if you weren't a history major, it it was just going to be general hours for graduation. So, you have like kind of a self-selecting group of people who want to be there usually, and um, and so it was very positive. I also did tours with faculty. And, and again, that was very positive as well. And the Taylor administration at the time was incredibly supportive of this. Um, you know, and, and I, I just came up with the idea after listening to other people and they said, sure, do it. And so it's like, okay, uh, we'll do it. But yeah, but I, those three ways of teaching, it was interesting because you would, um, the dynamics obviously would be different uh, depending on the delivery of, of the course, uh, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was well received. On behalf of the Seniors for Peace Steering Committee who makes plans for each of these monthly programs, we want to thank our speakers who do not get paid for coming to do this and to spend all this time uh, getting ready for the presentations. However, next month our speaker is coming from out of state and we will have some travel and lodging and meal expenses. Uh, we haven't asked for money from this group for a long time, but if you feel led to help with us, the expenses for maybe this next uh, couple months, uh, Dean Beery is our treasurer and any donation you can make now or later would be appreciated. So we want to thank Steve, especially for this good program, for all the others, and uh, let's give him our thanks.